Okay, in this talk I want to draw a connection between the two major themes of this course. Um, our developing understanding of the natural world and principles of sustainability and how that intersects and relates to creativity and creative thinking. Uh, as we've seen, one of the key components of this topic, creativity, is the ability to generate lots of ideas and the ability to generate different types of ideas. Uh, coming up with ideas, uh, which is something we're not really uh, trained to do, um, but more importantly, coming up with ideas that are novel, original, unique, uh, or at least non-typical. They're not our habitual ways of um, coming up with ideas. And one way that we do this is we look at things from different perspectives. We take a different angle and we take a different slant. Now, if we take this concept, um, we can expand it to include the world of nature. Uh, if you think of nature and the evolution of species and flora and fauna through the last 3.8 billion years, if there's one thing that can be said about the natural world is that it's incredibly creative. It's adaptable, it's flexible, it's regenerative. And so turning to the natural world uh, as a way of finding how, how and why that intersects with creativity can be extremely enlightening. So if we look at nature, uh, there's many ways we can approach it. Uh, the ideas in nature, the thoughts, the feelings, the beliefs. Uh, and artists and scientists, uh, people have been doing this uh, for millennia. And one of the key notions here is just simply the idea of nature as inspiration. All right. Uh, inspiration in the obvious sense in terms of the arts, so in the history of art, uh, whether it's Western or non-Western art, we see lots of artists turning to the natural world, uh, studying visually, uh, the natural uh, images and, and uh, formations of our planet. And in contemporary art, we find artists taking this to a slightly different level. Um, and here's an example of Andy Goldsworthy, a uh, British artist who uses uh, nature as a material, uh, doesn't use any glue or nails or um, you know, saws or anything like that. Everything's done just using natural materials. And not only that, but the concepts that he's creating, the visual ideas, embody the aspects of the natural world, most notably uh, transience or impermanence. So if you look at the icicles on the right, uh, there are just pieces of ice that were hanging from rocks that were literally glued together with water uh, that then froze. But as the sun rises, this piece would slowly start melting and, and collapse. Same with the, the leaf uh, sculptures on the top and on the left. And then the bottom one is a, an arrangement of sticks reflecting in a very calm and still lake. So Goldsworthy took the concept of nature not just as something to look at, something to copy, but as something to embody by making artwork um, that you know was itself based on the, the concepts and the process of nature. One of the key aspects of the natural world is evolution. Uh, how did nature evolve? Uh, how do trees, plants, animals, creatures um, change over time? And th the thing we can say about that is that these are really creative adaptions to changing environments. And so a species will evolve and adapt because they have a diversity of approaches, very similar to having a diversity of ideas uh, to changing situations, which can be construed as problems, issues, obstacles, uh, to adapt to, to, to tackle, to surmount. Um, and so it requires the ability to be flexible and responsive. And this can only happen uh, if you have a surplus of ideas, of thoughts, or if, if a species has a, a surplus of types, of you know, genetic mutations that allow it to respond differently to a full range of uh, needs and requirements. So what I'm going to be looking at and talking about in this talk is three particular aspects. Uh, biomimicry, uh, looking towards nature to get ideas in terms of um, imitating nature, the nature's processes and how these might help us with inventions. Uh, systems thinking, the whole idea that uh, everything really is connected and impacts everything else. And then finally the concept of emergence, the idea that through complex systems like the natural world and human social systems, uh, new ideas and novel unpredictable things can emerge that really are, are not um, you know not contained in the system necessarily they're they're referred to as emergent properties things that you know only happen when all these things come together so let's take those one at a time 
So we'll start with biomimicry. Um, the term itself is broken down right here. And this is you know, inspired design. What has nature done uh, historically that we could learn from? And it turns out there's, a, there's an awful lot. So we go back through history and we look at people like Leonardo da Vinci, um, famous not only for his artwork, but for also his notebooks and his scientific understanding and his thinking. Uh, we find in his notebooks lots of diagrams and drawings. And this one is a uh, particular drawing for a, a flying machine, you know, a set of wings for a person to fly uh, that's based on the design of a bat. So here's a clearer picture. But, you know, from observation of bat wings, da Vinci was able to sort of um, develop his idea of a wing. Now, he didn't do anything with it. He never made any wings and jumped off any buildings. It, that took a, a lot longer to happen. Um, and the Wright brothers are largely credited with the idea of developing flight. However, they actually didn't develop flight. Uh, people had developed airplanes before the Wright brothers. The only problem was they couldn't control them. They could make them go and they can make them take off. They can make them fly in the air, but they had no control. They couldn't turn them. They had a hard time landing them. And so the Wright brothers innovation was they were actually able to control the plane by allowing it to turn. And how they did that was through careful observation of bird wings and how birds in flight not only flap their wings up and down, but also twist their wings when they're turning. And so they, um, put these measures into their design so their plane was able to turn and twist and roll on, on several axes at the same time. And it was this breakthrough which made flight feasible. Okay, another example. Uh, this is a very common picture that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And these are common things that also I'm sure many of you are aware of. For most people, they're just irritating. They're burrs. Right? They stick to our legs or socks or shoes and we end up just picking them off and throwing them away. One thing about creative people is they tend to recognize problems where other people don't see things or issues where people just see uh, irritating things. So this gentleman, George de Mistral, wondered about this. What most of us would do is just take them off and throw them away, but he wondered why do they stick? There's nothing, there's no glue involved. Um, they're dry. There's what's the mechanism that allows them to stick? And so he analyzed these very clearly and very closely under a microscope. And he found out that they're based on a series of little tiny hooks, which then connect with our clothing. And so what he developed was uh, a material known as Velcro, which is based on tiny little hooks on one side, and little loops of, uh, in this case, plastic wire on the other side, and the two would hook into each other and pull apart. So we get the invention of Velcro inspired directly from the idea of hiking and getting burrs on your legs. Another example would be the Morpho butterfly. Um, one of the interesting things about butterflies is, you know, they're out there in the world and nature which has all sorts of weather and environmental conditions. But a bu butterfly's wings are very, very fragile. And so the question is, well, why doesn't rain and wind and all of these things damage butterflies, you know? Uh, so what uh, people have done more recently is they've looked at this um, structure of the wing and noticed that, you know, they're pretty much self-cleaning. So water droplets would fall onto the wings and then roll right off, picking up any kind of dust or dirt particles with them. And the reason for this is because of the nanostructure of the wing. So when you take the wing and you look closer, you get these little pieces. When you look closer, you find that this is the surface of the wing. And there are these tiny little uh, nanostructures that come off the surface. And so a water droplet, um, you know, would easily move along this surface without sticking to it, without attaching to it. And this breakthrough in terms of nanotechnology has led uh, in more recent times to development of self-cleaning paints and fabrics. Uh, wouldn't that be great to have a shirt you could spill all sorts of food on it, it would just fall right off, it wouldn't stick to it. So we have these materials right now, you know, paints that you, that, that are, you know, you, there's no dirt or anything that sticks to them. The only problem is they're extremely expensive. Um, so hopefully that'll come down. And then finally, another good example is the Eastgate Center, 
which is a large office building and mall in Zimbabwe. And this building uh, has barely any air conditioning, if at all. Uh, this part of Africa is very, very hot during the day and very, very cold at night. And so the cost of maintaining a building in terms of air conditioning and heating is usually prohibitive. And so what the architects of the Eastgate Center did was they studied termite mounds. And the thing about termite mounds is um, their construction allows pretty much for a constant temperature throughout the entire mound. Uh, and that has to do with the material that they used and the idea of these long, tall, kind of chimney tube-like structures. So what happens is that during the daytime, the material um, sucks the heat out of the air that's inside these structures. And that heat goes into the material. And at night, it releases that heat back into those tubes. Um, and, and then they exit the top of the the termite mound. And so the air inside the tubes, in other words, the space inside the mound stays fairly constant temperature. And that's exactly what they did with the Eastgate Center. And you can see these kind of tubes on the top of the roof here. Is they built it with a type of material um, that really allowed it to absorb heat during the day um, and then re readmit that heat at night. And so these are just a few examples of how we've, as humans, turn to the natural world um, to see what sorts of um, design challenges we could learn from. You know, nature, like I said, has been doing this for a very, very long time. And it's one of the most exciting fields at the moment where engineers and scientists and developers are really turning uh, to what we find in the animals, plants and creatures around us and learning how to make our world a much better place. All right, so that'll be the end of part one. In part two, we'll be looking at systems thinking and emergence.